Okay, here is part two of the lecture for Sissonville High School on intelligence. Um, all this talk about intelligence, we really haven't defined it yet. Before we talk about um, the first intelligence test that was ever constructed, let's see if we can get a working definition for intelligence. We've talked about what we think some of the characteristics of intelligence are. We've talked about different features of intelligence. We've talked about the idea that it's one thing, or maybe it's many things. But really, if we want a, a definition, we're talking about the ability to reason and solve, I have to spell it right, and solve problems well and to understand and learn more complex material. And that is the definition that should be pretty close to what's in your book as well. So the ability to reason and solve problems well and to understand and learn complex material. So that's kind of our best effort at a definition there uh, for intelligence. Let's get rid of that. Um, the Binet Scales, the oldest of the modern tests of intelligence, it was the very first test developed by Binet. Um, and his first test used some key principles. The first one, age differentiation. Uh, he looked for tasks that could be successfully completed by two-thirds to three-fourths of children in a particular age group. Uh, general mental ability. Conceived, he conceived of intelligence as a unitary factor, not separate mental abilities, which can be represented by a single score. And again, you can stop this and pause it as you need to write things down. Uh, the first scale in 1905, 30 tasks or tests of increasing difficulty. Uh, he categorized people roughly into three categories. And these were clinical terms, by the way. Uh, these are terms that we kind of throw around loosely when we don't like someone. But idiots, uh, the most severe intellectual impairment. Imbeciles, which denoted moderate impairment. And morons, which represent the mildest impairment. So those were the differing, the differing levels of impairment, if you will, and those were actually clinical terms. Uh, some of the tasks on the 1905 scale uh, follows, uh, excuse me, follows moving objects with the eyes, recognizing the difference between a square of chocolate and a square of wood. I'll kind of pick and choose here. Comparing five blocks to put them in order of weight. Uh, defining abstract words by designating the difference between boredom and weariness, for example. Uh, the 1908 scale grouped items according to age. So now we get the idea of mental age based on performance compared to average performance of individuals within a specific age group. And your book does also talk about mental age, and I would urge you to kind of go there and look at the book too, because I know these, these last two lecture video lectures are kind of technical. Um, example, if a six-year-old can perform tasks that an average eight-year-old can, then his mental age would be eight. So he would be sort of ahead of the game a little bit, if you will. If this same six-year-old could only perform tasks that an average four-year-old could, then he would be delayed or somewhat behind, uh, behind in the game, if you will. Uh, the first time the concept of the intelligence quotient was used, IQ equals mental age divided by chronological age times 100. And 100 would be perfectly average IQ. Um, if you want some idea, again, 100 is, is perfectly average. When you get into 120 and above, you're looking at very high to superior ranges of intellectual functioning. Um, Albert Einstein's IQ was 160. That's very, very high, as you might expect. Bill Clinton, former President Clinton's IQ score was 137 which is very high. Bill Gates, 160. Uh, Jodie Foster, her IQ is uh, 132. Uh, Madonna, the pop star from largely the 80s and 90s, but is still relevant today, 140. It's very high. 
uh, Shakira. A lot of you have probably heard of her. I think she's one of the judges on, um, um, I think it's, is it American Idol or The Voice? It's one of those. Um, popular uh, recording artist. Her IQ is 140, which is very, very high. So very you know, superior ranges of intellectual, superior range of intellectual functioning for a lot of these people here. So again, mental age is computed uh, by taking the uh, mental age divided by his or her chronological age and multiplying that by 100. So I'm 40. So if my mental age is 40 and my chronological age is 40, that means that my mental capacities or abilities are commensurate with my age or equal to my age. So 40 divided by 40 is 1. 1 times 100 is 100. So I would be perfectly average IQ. Um, intelligence testing, we do have various tests of intelligence that your book talks about. Uh, the thing to remember about intelligence tests, they are predictive. They are designed to predict what you will be able to do or how you will be able to perform in the future. They are standardized tests devised to predict how well someone will perform in the future. Uh, the Stanford Binet is a test of intelligence. The Weschler Intelligence Scales for Children, which we've talked about a little bit and are referenced in your textbook, and the Weschler Adult Intelligence Scales, which again we have referenced and are also in your textbook. Achievement testing, on the other hand, are standardized tests designed to measure what somebody knows right now. Okay, So in essence, the exam that I give you in class is an achievement test because it's measuring what you know at that point in time right now. It's not predicting what you're going to be able to do in the future. So achievement, test measure, uh, achievement tests measure what you have already learned. Uh, the Wide Range Achievement Test, the Iowa Achievement Test, Stanford Achievement Test are three examples of achievement tests. Now, we're back to the idea of heredity uh, versus environment. Do hereditary or biological factors impact student scores on achievement and intelligence tests? I could spend a lot of time on my soapbox talking about some of the problems inherent with intelligence and achievement testing and some of the inherent biases that are in some of these tests. Um, certainly heredity and, uh, and biology can impact scores on these tests in, in several different ways. Um, what about race, ethnicity, sex, and geographical location? Uh, do, those in, do these factors impact student scores on achievement intelligence tests? Um, and certainly they can. Um, a lot of these tests, especially in their infancy, were, were normed or put together to favor white people, Caucasians. Uh, questions that are on the test, on the early intelligence tests especially, you know, if you were an African American or if you were born in a rural area, uh, you may not know some of the answers to some of the questions that were on the test. Not because you were, in, because you were unintelligent, because you had not been exposed and would not have been exposed to these things or to these ideas that were on these tests. So there was, there was always a lot of talk about uh, test bias, and that is kind of a big deal. And test bias is talked about on page, I think it's roughly 230, uh, page 230 in your textbook. But that's an important term, so we're going to give this one to you. want to jot this one down as well. Test bias. This occurs when features of a test, whether it's an intelligence test or an achievement test, are designed in a way to lead a particular group to do well. Oops. Or poorly. Okay, so some tests, you know, unfortunately, and it's not on purpose necessarily, are just designed in a way that just favors certain groups, like people who live in cities, or people who are exposed to technology, um, Caucasians, okay? And so this has been a big problem and continues to be a problem uh, as well. Now, your book also talks about some other things that can impact test scores on these, um, on these standardized tests. Um... What about test anxiety? Write that down. I know some of you have already said that you do well in class, but when it comes to a test, it can create some anxiety. 
Uh, and certainly, I've had students who have done very well in class on in class assignments. They know the material, but they get so nervous and anxious when it comes time to perform on the actual exam that they don't do well. So test scores don't always accurately assess or measure what that person or student is capable of. So that's another big issue. What about something else that could impact standardized test scores? What about poor or bad social environments or physical environments? We jot that down as well. Uh, certainly you can see the children who come from disadvantaged backgrounds with parents maybe who are not able to or, or just don't want to stress the value of education. Uh, children who live in areas with high crime rates uh, in school systems where there's really not much funding to go into those schools to provide basic needs like computers and you know pencils, pens, textbooks, uh, or attract quality teachers. Um, those children are going to perform more poorly on standardized tests and in school in general. And a lot of times we look at these children, young adults, adolescents, and we just assume they're stupid or that they're lazy or that they're unmotivated, when in fact the environment has a lot to do with it, unfortunately. And then certainly, we just kind of mentioned it, but we could talk about, and your book talks about this as well, inferior schools. I mean, there are some schools that are fantastic. They do a great job, good teachers, good curriculum. And some schools just do a, a tremendously horrible job of educating um, the students. Uh, again, some schools in inner cities uh, we could talk about um, just are, are woefully just unprepared to educate students. Buildings falling apart in high crime areas, inability to attract teachers of quality, etc., etc., are going to produce high achieving children and it's not necessarily the fault of those individual students it's more of a reflection of of inferior schooling and your textbook gives you several examples of that um, as well uh, some other factors that could impact test scores are health just think of yourself have you ever taken a test on a day that you're sick you didn't want to miss school because you knew you had to take the test and you go in and you don't do very well because your head's pounding or your stomach's upset or maybe you have the flu. You know, your health is going to be um, is going to be a factor there. We could also look at sex differences. Uh, there's a lot of research that suggests that men and women have different uh, intellectual abilities, uh, which could be reflected on some of these uh, some of these standardized tests uh, and your book talks about uh, talks about these as well what about good or bad luck how many of you have ever taken a test and you knew there were six or seven that you just didn't know but you got them right you guessed and you just wow you just kind of lucked into it yeah that happens or bad luck you know maybe you just uh, there were four or five six you didn't know and you get close on them, but you missed them all. It, just, it was just dumb luck that you didn't get at least one or two of them right, which made a big difference uh, in your test score. So certainly. So those are some things to keep in mind, and you would kind of want to stay on top of those, I believe. So all of these things can impact. Um, education. If you want a definition, the process where society transmits knowledge, values, and norms, as well as ideologies, and thus the process of training, transmitting society's culture to the next generation. So there's more involved with education than just teaching stuff, teaching academics in class, or learning facts. Uh, it's really the transmission of culture from one generation to the next. Schooling, on the other hand, is formal instruction under the direction of specially trained teachers. So you are undergoing schooling. Supposedly, I am a specially trained teacher, as are all of your teachers. So that formal instruction in the classroom, or right here, for example, would represent uh, schooling. And let's call that the end of this part. Thanks.